A medical education needs to undertake a holistic approach rather than just treating pathology. When learning the art of medicine, trainees and physicians build empathy, communication, and teamwork skills. The importance of humanities in medicine, tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Health information based on science, built on trust. Hello, I'm Dr. Jill Cruz, your Prairie Doc host this evening. Tonight's episode is part of our 21st season, providing health information based on science, built on trust. We continue to provide trusted health information this evening as we discuss the importance of the humanities in medicine. Joining us to address this topic are Dr. Sunny Smith from Empowering Women Physicians and Dr. Jerome Freeman from Sanford Neurology Clinic. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the studio and through Zoom on this very chilly day in South Dakota. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves a little bit. Uh, Sunny, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, Empowering Women Physician, which I am intimately uh, familiar with um, and it's a great, wonderful program. Thank you. It's so lovely and beautiful to be here with you, Jill. <laughs> um, I want to first say that I first met Jill Cruz when I went to a conference and she was the keynote speaker. And the first sentences she said changed my life forever. I was a stranger in the audience and I was a burned out, tired young mother. And she taught me that the heart feeds itself first. So that was really profound to me that the heart feeds itself first, no matter what the oxygenated blood from the coronary arteries um, they go from the aorta to the coronary arteries before they go to any other organ. And so I think that's kind of very symbolic of what we try to stand for at Empowering Women Physicians is just you have to, all of the physicians and everyone, all human beings, have to care for themselves first before they can care for others. And so it's a very pertinent uh, topic for tonight's show. And I'm so honored and so glad that it's very full circle for me to um, have been on this journey with you for the past years and to be here with you tonight. Yeah, so I was so excited you were able to find time in your schedule to join us um, despite the time zone differences here. So thank you so much. So, well, Dr. Friedemann, tell about, about your background, specialty, uh, work with the med school. Well, I'm, I'm a neurologist and an internist. Uh, and I'm the chair of the Department of Neurosciences at the med school. I've done that for a long time. And one of my major interests is in teaching, in medical uh, student education. I, although I've done uh, undergraduate teaching as well at Augustana University in Sioux Falls. And then I have a clinical practice of, of neurology. And the humanities are currently a huge interest in our medical school and medical schools around the country. Uh, and uh, we've, I and other faculty have been making a concerted effort to use the humanities for the medical students, really beginning in their first year and, go, and going throughout their four years. And the students really love it. Yeah, and I think, and you were on the, the kindness episode the last season, which I think was so powerful. Or actually, it was a couple Thank seasons you. ago. Yeah, yeah. The, the dean of the medical school, uh, Mary Nettleman, and I mm -hmm. uh, came and talked about kindness. This is a very important initiative in the medical school. We decided that kindness is the focal point of our strategic plan for five years. And we define kindness as what we do, acting. and. Students love it, certainly patients love it, our staff uh, reacts to it. And so that was a fun, fun time to talk about that. Yes, definitely. So, um, so this episode, you know, usually we're talking about diagnoses and conditions. So this one's a little bit different. I think we're talking a little bit more about the, the art of medicine and that human connection that's so important with, with dealing with our patients. And I know Sunny, you're a family medicine uh, physician, uh, trained similar to me with that, that connection with the stories that we have with our patients. Do you want to talk a little bit about that importance of that connection between the physician and the doctor, how it's not just getting to the diagnosis as one part of healing someone? Do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe learning their story and how you go about that when you are still practicing? 
Yeah, of course. I think um, it's fascinating to even just hear about what's going on in South Dakota and uh, Sanford and medicine and kindness being central because it, it, this all interweaves so so well. And I was at UC San Diego for my entire career. Um, and we started the student run free clinic there in 1997. I was a first year medical student. My faculty members obviously were supervising and I stayed there until I stepped down at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, we were working on compassion and we actually with Danny Sanford um, started a compassion institute there. And one of the initiatives that I was involved with, with the Compassion Institute was working on communicating with patients um, and through the free clinic. Because you can imagine if as a first year medical student, I hadn't even interacted with many patients. I didn't know much medicine. <laughs> um, and I started working with patients who, my very, very first patient I ever saw was homeless. He was living on the street um, there had been an economic downturn, much like there's an economic downturn right now. And he got divorced, lost his home, was living in his car. And what was so healing to him was just having another human being look at him and talk to him and acknowledge him and want to listen. And I think in the world, it's not just people who are affected by homelessness or poverty or other things that they came to see me at the free clinic for, but there's a lack of connection, a lack of acknowledgement, a lack of um, caring, I think, for a lot of people in society. And so what, when you come to your physician, you want to feel seen, heard, understood, unrushed. And as the saying goes, the ancient saying is you listen to the patient, they're telling you the diagnosis. Um, and that the patient doesn't care how much you know until they know how much you care. AI, could it take care of some things and diagnose some things? Maybe with some labs, but that's not healing. So healing happens between two human beings and it always has and always will. Yeah, so that's beautiful. I, yeah, I think medicine, the, the science is honestly the easy part. It's yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you teach someone to be a healer? I mean, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Freeman, you kind of talk about your, your kindness and, and how do you teach that empathy? How do you teach that to a student? I, I can teach them the Krebs cycles. I can teach them how to diagnose pneumonia. I, can, I can't teach, how, can you teach someone to be kind? I, I think you can. And, and, and an important way to do it is by story. Since all of recorded history and before, humanity has gravitated to narratives, to stories, both of kindness as well as treachery and, and evil, frankly. And I, I think students, like all of us, re, react well to kindness and we remember stories. And so one of the things we focus on a lot uh, when we're, we're emphasizing kindness and compassion is the importance of narrative. Uh, the patient's narrative or story, what the family has to add, and then we use literature, you know, short stories, poetry, the arts, to also emphasize the important of con importance of context and getting the story. Yeah, I, I know we had a um, South Dakota State Medical Association meeting at the Art Museum one time, and the docent took us around, and we looked at Harvey Dunn, a famous South Dakota painter. We looked at Prairie is My Garden, probably his most famous picture of the mom holding these giant pair of scissors and the two kids behind her skirts, and she's holding a bouquet of flowers. And we spent a good half hour dissecting that as if we were diagnosing a patient saying, what is going on in this picture? You know, the, the look on the mother's face. I always thought it was a very serene, beautiful picture. And then I'm like, her face looks concerned. She is gripping that scissors really tightly. She's looking off into the distance. What is she seeing? We're on this open, vast prairie. Is there, where is her husband? You know, the children, the boy seems completely oblivious. The girl's grabbing onto her skirt what is happening in this story? And I think as doctors, we do become the um, collectors of patient stories because that's and, the first thing we learn, that how to take a good history. And, you, and Dr. Cruz, you just said very beautifully the power of the visual arts. And this has been talked about uh, at uh, centers around the country, but if students, medical students, 
I have experience in museums, for instance, and just looking at paintings and photographs, it improves their uh, observation skills and their interpretation skills. So that's just one example of, of using visual humanities to, to enrich kind of the, the values you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and Sunny, I know you did a lot of your uh, early work working with medical students and residents, um, especially with running your, your free clinics. Um, how did you help your students at that time kind of interact with these patients that might be different than what they are, you know, dealing with someone who's homeless or with food insecurities? How do you teach them to find that common connection where it would be very easy to just dismiss them or not connect? Is there a, a good way that you, you had with working with your students for that? Well, what's interesting is I find that medical students sort of self-select for people who are incredibly kind, caring, compassionate, seek to heal. And then unfortunately what happens is the medical system and training and socialization there and long hours kind of beats it out of them over a period of time. I mean, you there is a body of data and literature that shows that people show up with compassion and empathy and over time it starts to go down. And in part that's because of our focus on the left brain things, on the facts, on the grades, on the studying, on getting the answer right, as opposed to when we allow them to be who they are and cultivate those right brain activities and play and love and connection, that it's almost easier for a first year medical student in the first weeks and months to connect than it can be sometimes when they're in their third year and so stressed and worried about the other things. So I think, how do we do it? How do we bring them back to it? It's, you know, everyone knows how to talk to their grandma. And so you just have to bring them back to, it's just one human being talking to another human being. And um, I think that can be some of their strengths if we just remind them of that part and not trying to get it right. Right? Because sometimes we're so worried about getting the diagnosis right or presenting right that we aren't really um, seeing the human being for who they are. So it's just reminding them of what they already know and cultivating what's already there. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful thing. And uh, at least for me, some of the most fulfilling times in medicine weren't the times that I made this amazing diagnosis or came up with this beautiful treatment plan. It was the time when I sat down and I got a muffin for a dad whose wife was in labor yes. because because the OB floor was out. And you know, that ended up cementing this relationship with this family and you know, I got to bring their beautiful son into the world and I have I still have the picture of me holding their baby and you know, I think back to that family and I smile because of that connection over a muffin. It had nothing to do with how good of a you know, I was an intern that year. I, I was probably not the best at delivering babies. I was probably not the best at diagnosing, um, you know, preeclampsia or reading a, a rhythm strip, but I knew how to connect over a muffin. You know, and that, those are the and beautiful that's stories. that's what they remember. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is exactly what's so important. I just had a moment like that where I found a little, um, it's a little monkey with messy hair. Um, that was given to me when I was a third year medical student caring for someone in the hospital. And when he was discharged, they gave me, it was my first gift ever from a patient, third year medical student, first rotation, don't really know anything, certainly the least skilled medical person on the team. But I was the person who was most present at the bedside and saw his messy hair and we laughed a lot. And so it's literally 20 something years later. And my husband just saw it in our home and said, do you want me to bring this? <laughs> and I thought, oh, that is so sweet and precious. It's it's the human connection that sticks with us. And every doctor has these stories, right? It's there's and they can be patients you've seen recently, patients you've seen decades ago, and they stick with us just as much as they stick with the patient. Yes, definitely. So well, as we've been discussing, for physicians, it's important to keep a work-life balance and pursue habits and hobbies and passions outside of the workplace. So Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer spoke with one doctor who lives fully out her passion for music. Dr. Candace Williams is an anesthesiologist 
and music producer. Growing up, she was surrounded by music and knew she wanted to be a musician as well as a doctor. I grew up in a church setting with a lot of music around me every Sunday, you know, from my family members. So I have a lot of illustrious musicians in my family and I was surrounded by music all the time. So, you know, that's something that's been with me before medicine entered my life. During her schooling, Dr. Williams suppressed her musical talents to focus more on medical school. Over time, she felt more unhappy each day before taking time off for herself. So I took some time and started soul searching and spending time at my piano and that turned into writing songs and that turned into writing instrumental songs. And I infused a lot of these songs with healing intentions and prayers uh, for people because I know as a pain doctor, many people are out there, they're hurting, right? She then started writing these songs for healing and relaxation and found out music isn't used as much compared to other relaxing modalities like yoga. And so I figured, well, why not shed light on that? Because I feel like it's one of the things that's simple to implement. It's universal. <laughs> Everybody loves music, right? Um, and so why not get out there and talk about it more and use it more? Dr. Williams plays her music on piano, keyboard, and electric organ. And many of her relaxing tunes are infused with music she grew up with. The main thing that I grew up playing and what I was playing mostly is gospel music. So gospel and jazz. Jazz is my more recent uh, muse. I've played on a few recordings and I really love jazz as a genre, just a way to express oneself. When Dr. Williams plays music, she says the feeling is surreal and she feels transported to a different place. That feeling also helps her when she is struggling. I'm a physician, right? But I'm a person too. And I have pain. I have, I'm have. i a chronic pain doctor, but I have pain too. And I have it, and no lie, this is true. I have listened to my own music at times when I have had pain, right? And it's made me feel better. So it's one of those things of, you know, kind of taking your own medicine, if that makes any sense. Doing what she loves prompted her to find other physicians through Facebook that also do similar artistic activities and wants to remind physicians you're not a physician 24 seven, but a person who has loves and passions outside of work. Believe it or not, there's lots of doctors who not only do they do their art or their music or their crafting in their spare time, but there's people who are having full on art shows. They're, they're I mean, they have a full on fledged second career in what they do that's creative. And so that inspires me. That's pretty much my goal. Well, that's wonderful. The music at the end there was actually music that she had written. So I think that's really neat that she's sharing that, that with us. So coming out of the pandemic with doctors feeling more stressed and burned out, how can we help doctors rediscover their passions or you know, kind of reconnect with those hobbies? Dr. Freeman, do you have any suggestions or you know, what sort of things did you do to kind of help rejuvenate yourself outside of medicine so you can come back to a clinic day fulfilled and and ready to well, give. All of us are different. I have a, I have a lot of interests uh, outside uh, medicine. Uh, my wife and I live in a, on a rural acreage and we always have a lot of projects to do and during the pandemic we created a lot more trails on our land, did a lot more cutting out, a thinning of wood and the trees and things just because we had so much time on the land. But I think in general, getting back to the humanities, uh, just relishing the, the stories that are available, uh, the literature is so important. Uh, I don't think he'd mind my saying this, our dean of the medical school, Dean Ridgway, has started to read a poem every morning, he, he told me and some other students. And he, he finds it inspiring, as do I. Poetry is so beautiful, it's, it's condensed, uh, usually, not always, but usually it's a little story, a little narrative. 
and it can be very sustaining. Yeah, I, and before the show we were talking about poetry and specifically Anne Sexton's poem, The Doctors. Do you want, I know you've got some of it quoted to memory, but I think that poem is so beautiful of capturing the essence of what it feels like to be a doctor. Yeah, it really does. It talks about how doctors try to avoid harm and how they realize they're not always going to be successful. But Anne Sexton was a very, very uh, insightful person and she says at the end of the poem that doctors should fear arrogance more than cardiac arrest. If they are too proud, and some are, then they leave home on horseback and God returns them on foot. It, truly a cautionary tale mm -hmm. for, for all of us to be humble, to, to, to realize that we don't have all the answers, to realize we have to collaborate. Uh, it's a beautiful piece. Yes, definitely. So, uh, Anne Sextant, The Doctors, look it up. It is a beautiful poem with every line is is got something profound in it. So, Dr. Cruz read it for the students yes. before before the show because I mean you're moved by it, and I think mm -hmm. they were too. Yeah, definitely. So, and you know, even when I was in medical school, I did a lot of writing, drawing, poetry to kind of deal with some of those big emotions that you're going through as a student for the first time. First time a patient dies, first time you have to give someone a bad diagnosis, first time you deliver a baby. You know, the highs and lows that you go through in medicine are quite extreme and to find outlets to express that I think is very important and finding a community to share the, those things with. So, Sunny, do you want to talk about how you're using Facebook as a way to find kind of these communities for doctors to connect and kind of rejuvenate and um, find meaning, purpose, and loving their job again? Yeah, so my uh, journey into having a Facebook group was sort of unintentional. I, I put something up that was intended to be there for only a couple of weeks. And I was um, already coaching women physicians. I had a podcast um, and I wanted to give away a trip. And so the fastest way I could think to do that, I wanted to give a trip to women physicians who had listened to my podcast that I had never talked to and that had found something that we said, applied it to their life and made real change. We talk about mental health. We talk about physicians being human beings. We talk about allowing ourselves to be human. We talk about holding space and dreaming big and allowing yourself to live this life the way that you would like to, instead of the way the system says you have to, a patient every 15 minutes, for instance. Um, and so the group came about um, it, so that I could give away a trip to someone who had made some changes. And what happened is quickly, this was about three years ago now, thousands of women physicians quickly flooded in and were telling their stories. Just like we were talking about, about narratives here. People were sharing their narratives about what they had done, what they had overcome, how they had opened up about being human. And, you know, that they had taken the things that they had changed. And so it became quickly so meaningful and so deep and so profound within just weeks that my friend, Hollis Aubrey, physician who runs the largest physician group of women physicians, which is the conference where I met you, mm -hmm. um, she said, Sunny, this is too meaningful. You can't possibly shut this down. And so now I think of these groups that physicians are doing on Facebook, Candace Williams had just mentioned that she is connecting with physicians on Facebook, is that when we aren't finding the connection within the systems that we're in, we're finding spaces on our own to do it for ourselves. And so people reach out and if they're struggling and saying things like, my dad is dying, is it okay to take a day off work or to tell my patients I can't come in? You know, people don't know that it's okay to be human. And so that's what we do there in these groups is we support each other and say, it's okay to be human. I see your humanity, it's okay. Yes. Uh, that's beautiful. And I am a big fan of, of Hollis Aubrey. She's been on the show before. Big fan of, of your group too, Sunny. Uh, like I said, it's, it's so interesting that this importance of connection and community, um, you know, how can we have that connection with ourselves 
with other doctors and then also turn around and have that connection with patients. Um, Dr. Freeman, do you want to talk about how, how do we show our humanity to patients? Is it okay to tell them we don't know or oh, yeah. we're, we're scared think, uh, or we're worried or, you know, that's, where uh, do we go? Honesty is very important, but I, I think the just being kind means a lot. Just to, to convey to patients that we care both in how we we talk to them and how we get back to them if they have questions. Uh, patients remember that and they talk about it for years sometimes. Uh, I, think it, I think kindness, the kindness we've been focusing on specifically in the med school, it pays huge dividends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So has the pandemic changed how we interact with patients? I mean, I've had a couple times where recently the patient is like, can you take your mask down? I need to see your face. Yeah. I need to see who's taking care of me. It, the masks have been very hard. In fact, early on in the pandemic, I wrote an essay, The Eyes of March, because I was remarking on walking through the, the halls of the hospital and how usually we respond to people's smiles and nods and all we could see is, is the eyes. One of, one of the hardest things during, for me during the pandemic was talking to people who were resistant to getting the COVID vaccine. And in my practice, many of the people have suppressed immune systems and there was compelling reason to be vaccinated. And so my nurse and I spent a lot of time explaining to people uh, the importance of, of the vaccine and uh, we were very pleased with the results. We th my nurse claims, I think she's right, that probably 50% of the time when people were, were resistant, they ended up getting the vaccine, which is pretty darn good. And it wasn't because of a solid, logical argument. It was because of that connection. I think it was trusted. because of the connection. Yeah. And, and actually, a medical student and I wrote about this. You don't just argue with somebody, get the vaccine. You have to listen to them and see why they're hesitant and understand their fears and then teach about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we tried to do. Yeah, excellent. Well, I think this is very important for us to learn as, as doctors that that sacred space of, Sonny, you talk about it beautifully. Can you explain the art of holding space for someone? Because I think we do it at the bedside, mm -hmm. but it's, it's such a nebulous thing to think about. What, what does it mean to hold space for someone and why is it so important that we do? I'm sure there's many ways it could be described and it probably means many things to many people. But I think just allowing people to share their point of view, their experience, to be there for all of it. You can think of this particularly in palliative care, for instance, if you're gonna give someone a diagnosis, you're gonna hold space for that whole room, the whole family. There could be someone crying there could be someone screaming, there could be some, someone mad and hitting the door. And you're there to hold space for all of it because there's no right or wrong way to be human and to respond to what's happening in your life, in your health, in your diagnosis. And so it, it's just, again, acknowledging the humanity, making space for the humanity. You don't have to put on airs and act proper, I'm here for all of it. And we listen and we wait. And when we're ready and they're ready, we mirror back to them what we hear them saying. And we name the feelings that they say because that calms down the brain, calms down the amygdala when you talk about kindness or compassion, naming the emotion decreases the distress in the brain. So if someone says, I'm so mad, you just hold space for that and you wait. And when they're done talking, understand you're so mad. Then they feel seen and heard. And then when you acknowledge that, you can move forward. Yeah, and, and I think that not being afraid of that silence, just to, to sit mm -hmm. and have that beautiful silence and not to rush to fill it, that you can Right. Let them express what they're they're needing to say. And that can be more healing than any prescription I write. You know, what's interesting is when when I was at the medical school and we would teach people in the room these practice clinical exams 
if people hand a tissue right away when you're crying, it's sometimes even interpreted as that it's not quite appropriate to cry and here you go, here's your tissue to stop crying. Mm. Um, but to just allow, it's, oh, it's actually okay if people cry, right? It's okay, we don't have to hush them or say they're there. You wanna show some compassion and some action and let them know you're there for them. But as you said, just sit in silent patience, waiting. Yeah, beautiful. That's all. all right, well, we're, we're getting short on time here. We've just got a few minutes uh, of chatting here before we go to our next roll in. Uh, but Dr. Freeman, I want to talk about how doctors, we, we put on our white coat and that kind of, I think sometimes can be something to hide behind, something to make you feel like you're invulnerable or to, to show this um, kind of distinction between you and the patients. The first thing we do when someone goes in the hospital, we give them a gown, we kind of take away, I think both the gown and the white coat take away part of the humanity of of both the doctor and the physician. Is there a way we can kind of try to bring our humanity together that we recognize the patient as a person and the doctor as a person? Is there a good way to express that? I think an important way is to communicate with patients and families with common language, to be very particular about not using medical terminology and uh, not assuming that patients necessarily understand uh, the medical options, but to patiently and, and kindly uh, discuss it. In the hospital, I've always thought it's very important, even if you, your visit is a brief one, to sit down when you're talking to the patient, even if it's a brief visit. Sitting down says, I've got time here enough to listen to you and to talk to you. Uh, I, I think not forgetting to, to say to people, boy, your situation is tough, or you're going through a lot, or boy, uh, this must be really wearing on you. If, if, if you express in just common language the fact that you realize the situation is a hard one, it can, it can be very uh, affirming for patients, and I think make a help make a strong connection between the physician and patient. Yeah, I, I think that that reaffirming, I see you and I see your pain and I acknowledge that can be very powerful, you know, because it's, unfortunately you'll hear patients say, the doctor didn't even listen. Doctor didn't, doctor didn't even look at me. They were in and out of that room so quickly, you know. And there are forces that promote that, I mean, mm -hmm. many, uh, hospital systems encourage physicians to be keyboarding on, mm -hmm. on the computer while they're talking to the patient. And I personally think that's not a good idea. I'd much rather just sit, look at the patient, talk to them, maybe I make some notes, yep. but then I would, I would do the computer work later. I yep. think that something like that Beautiful. can make a difference. All right, well, as doctors, it is important to remember the humanity side of our job. I spoke with doctor and author Rana Odwish about her experience that led to her to write a book about the humanity on the part of doctors. Do you want to share a little bit about your story? Because I'm guessing our audience hasn't mm -hmm. read it and kind of how that has changed to how you uh, are as a physician and as an educator, because I know you, you teach residents in your job. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you for having me. My patient story really began at the end of my medical training. I was just finishing my pulmonary and critical care fellowship at Henry Ford Health in Detroit. And I was seven months pregnant. I was out for a celebratory dinner and I had the most severe acute onset of abdominal pain that I could have imagined. It was like this instinct kicked in that I knew that pain was going to kill me. And that pain was a result of a tumor that I didn't know I had in my liver that had burst. And it was uh, something that caused me basically to bleed to death. Um, I was fortunately resuscitated, but went into multi-system organ failure, lost the baby, spent quite a lot of time in our surgical ICU, recovering from all of my organs that had failed. And really that set into motion a kind of 
10 year patient experience where I saw us from the other side of the bed, things that I had been a part of, ways of communicating, lapses in communication, all of it was, was quite jarring from the patient perspective. I loved how you said in, uh, on page 63, at the intersection of a lack of control and absence of rigorous attention is distrust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you said there, there are items left at the door when one enters the hospital, chief among them comfort, a bit of dignity and any semblance of control. And, and I, I do, I, when you read it in black and white, it just makes so much sense about, oh yeah, the first thing we do is we take away their clothes and make them wear a gown. I mean, we, we strip them of a lot of identity and control. So is there a way that we as doctors can kind of help get some of that control back or help patients with that lack of control that they're feeling in the hospital? I think that's such an important point. The depersonalization that's just sort of baked into the institutional structure of hospitals forces us to go a little bit further to get to really know who our patients are as people. I think our training really disadvantages us into believing that you know, we are there for the medical aspect of this moment in time and nothing else is relevant except what's pertinent for this case or illness or acute exacerbation. And for our patients, that's just not true. They're coming to us as whole people with a contextualized life story before and what they hope for after this. The easiest thing that we can do is honor that story and get to know who they are truly as people, what their hopes for the future look like, what a good day looks like to them, who's important, who are they hoping to get home to, whether it's a, a pet friend or a person, what hobbies do they hope to return to. When we do that, I think we open up channels for connection that are nourishing to us as well, because now we're not you know, taking care of a diabetic ketoacidosis, we're taking care of a person with hopes and dreams and wishes. Yes, and and, and I know you, uh, in one of the stories that you've shared, there was a patient in the ICU that had the note cards and wanted the, the doctors to write to, to make, you know, what are your hopes for this person? And I know one of your trainees had a hard time coming up with, with what they wanted to share because that was so out of their um, wheelhouse of diagnose and treat and follow this plan. It, she taught me a lot. I'm happy to report that patient is still alive. And I just was communicating with her yesterday. She underwent a bilateral lung transplant and has been living her best life. She looks better than me. Um, but at that moment, she was dying in our ICU. And we had very little hope that she would live to be transplanted. And so for her to ask us, to write a hopeful message felt false based on our medical knowledge. And we had to really tap into the truth that you can heal even if you don't cure, that our proximity to her, our wishes for her, all of that was healing. Her, her religion was very nourishing to her. Um, and we're sort of, we always keep that, you know, on the side or out of sight. So she drew it into our line of sight and I'm grateful for that. And, and I know you, you talked about in your book, learning to sit with pain yeah. and, and the importance of, of, you know, acknowledging that emotion. Can you explain kind of what you mean to our audience? Like, what does it mean to sit with pain? Yeah. My sort of personal journey in finding meaning in medicine has gone from a place where I used to believe that if I couldn't heal someone, that I didn't have value in their space, in their room, in their care plan. And what I came to understand is really, truly how much value we bring when we are just willing to sit with difficult things, when we are willing to be a container for suffering, to be able to say, I can't help solve this. I wish I could cure this, but I can sit with you as you go through it and navigate it alongside you. 
we're not taught to value just being present for suffering. And, you know, I had a patient whose family really taught me that of everything I did as she died, it was just my willingness to sit with them and not deny their pain that really helped them to heal. Well, you, you talk a lot about with the patient um, experience and patients uh, with that lack of control talking about anxiety and how um, you, you said in the book, uh, we attempt to bludgeon the feelings into submission with data. And I've done that as a doctor. I've had a patient saying, I'm scared. I'm like, well, well, this is the percentage. This is your outcomes. This is, and they're still anxious. And I'm like, I, I gave them all the information. Why are they still anxious? Because it doesn't respond to data. So how do we <laughs> address that? Yeah. I'm laughing because even though I know this now in my work life and I look for emotional cues in the form of questions and I recognize that, oh, that question is really anxiety. That question is really fear. That question is really distrust. And I address the emotion beneath it. I still do that very poorly in my outside of the hospital life. So when my husband was concerned about anesthesia for an EGD, I'm like, we do this all the time, the risk of complication. And I started citing data and I was like, wait, no, of course that doesn't work. I understand you're concerned. It must be scary to relinquish control to someone you don't know. These are the ways they'll keep you safe. I know what I need to say. And so often I don't. I know. I, I remember a patient came in to see me for an ER follow-up and they had a small amount of rectal bleeding. Um, their hemoglobin was stable. All the labs looked good. They were very young. Everything was very reassuring. And I couldn't figure out why they were so anxious. And I, I remember I had a student at the time and I said, we, we need to find the anxiety. We have to follow the anxiety to find what's going on here. I said, we find that cause, then I can give her the right information and I can answer her quickly. We talked a little bit more and she found out that her neighbor had recently been diagnosed with stage four colon cancer and they started with you know, blood in the stool. And so that was the first thing in her mind is I have stage four colon cancer and I'm gonna die like my neighbor. And you know, after addressing it, we're like, no, actually it was just bleeding hemorrhoids. This is very benign, this is very easy to treat, but in her mind, she, she correlated those two. And if I hadn't asked that question, I don't think I ever would have gotten, to, you know, what are you scared for? So I think it's important for me to train my students. I say, look for that fear and then ask them about it and acknowledge it. I, I mean, you mentioned in the book, I love this quote, if we don't recognize emotion, we certainly can't respond to it. So, you know, and fear is not responding to data. So we need to find that emotion, find the fear. I'll, I'll tell that all the time to my students, find the fear and then respond to that. And the story, because the best medicine in the world doesn't work on the wrong story. So if her story is, I have cancer, they just haven't found it yet. And nothing will appease that until you know. You talk a lot about seeing a patient suffering and acknowledge it. And then has that changed how you've trained students are kind of talking about um, your uh, Clear Conversations project. Uh, can you tell more about that? Yeah, Clear Conversations is um, something that we started at Henry Ford Health probably 10 years ago. It's inspired by Vital Talk, which is a national communication training program. Um, we use improvisational actors as the patients and we really take the trainees and the attendings through a simulated conversation, but simulated isn't, doesn't quite capture what it is. When you're sitting there in conversation with these very skilled improvisational actors, it truly feels like the experience of talking to a patient's family member and that really allows for experiential learning. So we use cases that, you know, we need to practice on before we experience them in real life so that we limit the harm that can come. Because we really believe that 
conversations are a procedure, just like any other procedure that we train for, though they're all different, there are signposts you can look for and mark and plan for. You can know that giving information well means small chunks and no jargon and pausing and asking what they've heard so far, if there's clarity in your communication, looking for opportunities to respond with empathy and compassion and aligning with their values. These are things we should always do, but it's not something that's necessarily trained in school. So we've had to do that on the back end of it. Yeah, I mean, because there's very different styles in physicians, you know, and very different needs for patients. Some people like just give it to me straight, don't sugarcoat it. And other people, you know, they want a little bit more gentle approach, you know, don't, don't scare me with all of the possibilities, you know, tell me what you think is most likely here. Some want all the information, some don't want, you know, hardly any information or tell my family, don't talk to me. You know, it's, it's very, um, individualized, which, you know, you, you can't just say the textbook is going to work for every single patient every single time. Not at all. It's the intersection of those relationships where we can find healing. And I think for, you know, students coming in, I, I want them to know that medicine really needs to bend a little bit towards them and allow them to be their full selves. Because when we stay whole and we can function from that place, we really can be healers. Thank you so much for talking with us. Like I said, I absolutely love your book. I've read it several times and I find something new each time I read it. Thank you so much. In healthcare, misinformation can be as deadly as the most serious disease and spread just as quickly. For 21 seasons, the Prairie Doc organization has provided health information based on honest science in a respectful and compassionate manner. Medical professionals from your own communities volunteer each week to answer your questions. There is no cost to call in or to watch our shows. Follow the Prairie Doc on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube to access the entire Prairie Doc library today. Merriam-Webster defines humanity as compassionate, sympathetic, or generous behavior or disposition. It is also defined as the quality or condition of being human. The first definition is what people want in a healthcare provider. We all want to be taken care of by a caregiver who is compassionate, kind, sympathetic, and generous with their time and knowledge. Healthcare providers spend countless hours taking care of their patients. In order to do this, at times we ignore our own needs for rest, sleep, and food. We recite mantras of first, do no harm, and the patient comes first. Many of us strive for this vision of the perfect provider or to be called a healthcare hero, as we were during the pandemic. Unfortunately, all healthcare providers are also the second definition. We are all human, and that means we make mistakes. We get tired and hungry. We get angry and can be afraid. Despite being called heroes, we often do not feel heroic or even act heroic. We may say the wrong things in the wrong way. We could hurt patients with our words or actions. This is not done intentionally or with malice. It is a side effect of the second definition, being human. Most healthcare providers desperately want only to be the first definition, yet it is easy to find examples of times that we have failed. These two definitions do not need to be at odds with one another. The first has been praised and encouraged to be shared by healthcare providers. The second definition has, until recent years, been suppressed. Each generation of healthcare providers strives to be better than the one before. Now, there is specific training in medical school teaching how to admit mistakes that one has made, 
and sincerely apologize. Medical students are not graded on just their knowledge of disease and ability to diagnose. They are also graded on their ability to communicate and interact with patients. The art of bedside manner is something that can be taught. However, it takes a career to truly refine that skill by making mistakes, identifying them, and learning to be better next time. Allowing healthcare providers to show both sides of our humanity, the good and the bad, will allow for more trust and greater connection with the very people we are trying to heal. That connection will, in turn, heal the healthcare provider. This mutual healing will help us tap into the compassion, sympathy, and generosity that makes us human and drew us to this profession in the first place. Together, we can heal and be better by seeing all the humanity that we all share. Well, thank you so much to our guests, Dr. Smith and Dr. Freeman, for volunteering their time to help us learn more about humanities and medicine. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube, or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper or online, and be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, thanks for joining us for another episode of Health Information Based on Science, Built on Trust. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Like all of medicine, surgery has experienced change at an ever-accelerating pace, but the apparent revolutions are built on a foundation of step-by-step -step science. Advances in surgery, next time On Call with the Prairie Doc. Mom, can you believe we are already entering the 21st season of On Call with the Prairie Doc? It's amazing. Last year was so fun celebrating our 20th season. It was great to see the old shows and to just highlight the honest science and trust that our program is built on and that Dad started so long ago. Yeah, and to see how it's grown. You know, to see it, it's not just a television program that you can find on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock, but it's something that you can check out on uh, one of your favorite podcast networks or YouTube. Share these videos to your friends and family on Facebook. There's a lot of ways that Prairie Doc is making an impact. Uh, we know it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for you, our viewers, and for our corporate sponsors and our, our private sponsors. We are completely privately funded foundation. So your contributions make a difference. And did you know that a couple of years ago, the South Dakota Department of Health asked us to do some special programming that they felt was important for the whole state to know. We felt really honored that they would ask us to be a part of that. So you, you donors, you helped in providing good education for the state. You know, as a nurse, uh, one of my primary responsibilities is to advocate for my patients. And this program really allows our prairie docs as well as the volunteer doctors to advocate for public health across our state and into the surrounding states as well which makes it particularly nice when a patient will come up to me and tell me that they really enjoy the program or my parents watch your show every week yeah i hear that a lot and it really is humbling and gratifying yeah and and i'm excited and humbled uh, to be joining the Healing Words Foundation Board as we work to make an impact on the lives of our supporters and to further that mission. If you would like to help us with this important work, we hope that you'll talk to your friends, you'll share our program on your social media page. And if you want to make a financial gift, please give directly at prairiedoc.org or mail your gift to the P.O. Box 752 Brookings, South Dakota 57006. Thank, Thank you, you for, for your support. support. All right, Mom. You ready to go for a little walk? You bet. Let's get, those, get those steps. <laughs> <laughs>
Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... At Avera, our nationally recognized health system will be right here with you, with care and coverage. Hello Possibility. Hello Healthy. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, and Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications.